We're broke. We're broke. America's broke. We're broke. We're broke. We're broke. We're broke. We don't have the money anymore. Thousands of Pasco County school employees are waiting for word on who will lose their jobs this week. State legislatures looking to cut budgets are increasingly targeting the courts, which have been forced to lay off thousands of staff workers. Up to 80 police officers may be laid off by the end of June. Washington's been obsessed with cutting spending. Everyone's talking about cuts. No one's talking about where the money's going to come from. We're a wealthy country. We're not broke. The money's there. We're just not looking in the right places. Schools are laying off teachers left and right. Everything that made America what America is is suffering. And there's, it's plain and simple greed. General Electric, one of the giants of American business, is on the hot seat tonight because of its 2010 tax bill. Zero. M-O-N-N-E-Y. U.S. uncut protests over the weekend. They again went after Bank of America because apparently they have a huge amount of profits and they don't pay much taxes. If they want to do business here, they have to pay taxes here. That's just how it goes. Exxon Mobil, largest oil company in the world, made 19 billion of profits in 2009, paid no federal income taxes. So if you're working stiff, you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. You're paying taxes, but if you're Chevron and you made ten billion in profits in 2009, you don't have to pay any taxes. Citigroup made more than four billion in profits, but paid no federal income taxes. M O N N E Y M O N N E Y. One sector of the U.S. economy is paying less. Then either we run larger deficits or others are asked to pay more. It just shifts the burden to the average honest taxpayer, and that's what's so totally offensive and so totally unacceptable here. For me, the connection was just made about really how much these large corporations are getting away with. And, you know, we work hard, we pay our taxes, it's not always easy, and they don't. The losers, in effect, are all of us who have to pay more tax as a result of the multinational firms paying less. We need to start talking positively about where the money is going to come for critical investments in education, health, infrastructure, and jobs. And that's a conversation we're just beginning to have. Tell me more about uh, U.S. Uncut. What is the main mission here? Um, U.S. Uncut is a grassroots organization that self-organizes through social media, and we call out corporate tax dodgers so that we don't have to go and cut valuable public services. Uh, we came to New York for the Bank of America Investor Conference, which we thought was a shareholder conference. Me being a shareholder of one share of Bank of America stock, we thought we'd be able to walk in because it would be public. It happens to be like a hedge fund conference. This is Kevin Stitt, Bank of America Investor Relations. Before we begin Investor Day, let me remind you... Hey, I think we're uh, taking off. Okay. Is there a way I could have that badge just for uh, memento? Uh, I think I threw it away. Yeah, unfortunately, and I don't think we could give it to you. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. You guys have a great day. Me too. Me too. The security's a little tighter. That's about 300 folks. So, we made badges. We have uh, regrouped. We've got a suit for you. Wow, nice job. Please refer to the slide titled Forward Looking Statements, and it's in each of the presentations. Bank of America, pay your taxes. When you don't pay your taxes, we have to fire firefighters and teachers and public servants. You're a tax dodger. And Bank of America, you're bad for America. Pay your taxes. Tax dodgers. Bank of America is a tax dodger. Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Do you pay your taxes? I do. Why isn't this company? Bye. <laughs> what did you do? Wait, did you see this? This is one of the best moments of my life. My life, it's done. I love this man. I love this man. I've known this guy for like two hours. Is this the movie? No, this is uh, people organizing to get corporations to pay their taxes like the rest of us. 
performance. People organizing to get uh, multinational corporations to pay their taxes. Most corporations don't pay their taxes. Yeah, I know. I just read that on the cover up. Did you see it? Yeah, there's one, maybe there's one individual, but we're talking about companies that own trillions of dollars together and they don't pay their taxes. Corporations in the U.S. pay income tax on their U.S. earnings. The statutory tax rate is 35%. The U.S. corporate tax rate at 35% is one of the highest in the world now. You know, you look at countries in Europe, they are in the kind of high 20s and low 30s. But most corporations pay far less than that 35% rate. Now, the effective tax rate is a measure of what they really pay. So for a typical corporation that has a lot of multinational activity, their effective tax rate might be in the low 20s or in the teens or even in the single digits. Some of them are paying a negative tax rate on their U.S. earnings because of the things they're doing offshore. They're playing all kinds of games to reduce their U.S. income tax to ridiculously low levels. The issue of companies shifting income ultimately to tax havens should really be at the top of the agenda right now. Somewhere on the order of $70 billion a year are lost to the U.S. Treasury just from offshore tax shelters. Offshore financial centers are typically small countries uh, with few natural resources. They've created a business-friendly environment, business-friendly laws in order to attract foreign capital. There's a belief that the offshore world is somehow the province of shady businessmen and rich folks who set up offshore bank accounts to cheat on their taxes, but largely people who we've never really heard of. And that belief is false. Basically, every major technology company and every major drug maker in the U.S. relies on the offshore world for a very significant portion of its profits. The Cayman Islands, where uh, you have just in one relatively small building uh, thousands and thousands of post office boxes in effect, just box numbers. It's called the Ugland House, where companies here claim to have an office, even though there's no economic activity that is going on there. Multinationals will use a tax haven as a way station. That is not a place where they put money like people do. They pass money through there so it doesn't get taxed in the place that they earn the money. The money only passes through in a sort of digital and political sense, but the money itself is onshore. It's in a bank in the United States, but it's booked in these places. They just use the international tax rules to shift profits out of the United States and other high tax countries into low tax countries, and that's called transfer pricing. The whole game in transfer pricing is to allocate as much income as possible to a low tax country or a tax haven and as much expenses as possible to a high tax country like the U.S. The problem is that you have companies that are allocating for tax purposes the bulk of their profits to parts of the world where in some cases they have no employees, they have no sales, they have no real economic activity of any kind. Under U.S. tax laws, there's nothing illegal about what they're doing. But by any reasonable standard, when most of your business is in the United States and most of the intellectual know-how, research, and productivity is in the United States, the profits that are taxed should also be in the United States. One of the most interesting examples of how transfer pricing moves profits around the world is with a company called Forest Laboratories. And they make a very successful antidepressant called Lexapro. This is a company that has virtually 100% of its employees in the US. It has almost 100% of its sales in the US. Its headquarters is in the US. But the bulk of its profits end up in Bermuda. The way Forest does this is, if you walk into a drugstore and you buy a bottle of Lexapro, you know, a chunk of that goes to the drugstore and a chunk of it goes to a drug distributor. But the majority of it ends up with a forest unit in Ireland, which actually manufactures the drugs and sells them to its U.S. parent company. The reason why they have their manufacturing located in Ireland is because Ireland has a low tax rate. But Forrest does not simply let the profits stay in Ireland. Forrest pays royalties for the use of the patent of the drug 
to another Irish company that claims for tax purposes that it's managed in Bermuda. The office that they list as their center of management in Bermuda, it's a law office. There are no forest employees there, but U.S. tax law and Irish tax law lets forest allocate the majority of its overseas profits to ultimately a law office in Bermuda. Every major pharmaceutical company is engaged in this practice. Pfizer has become so adept at their profit shifting that now they report 100% of their profits in offshore locations and they have no profits being reported in the United States. In fact, they have losses in the United States. For the U.S. Treasury, the implications are a tremendous loss of tax revenue. But on the flip side, for the companies, the benefits are enormous. The effective tax rate is reduced, their reported profits on Wall Street are increased, and the stock price stays strong. Drilling is done with power and equipment from big barges, tied up to the well platforms. I have to speak Spanish because 92% of Creole's employees are Venezuelan. Ever since really the period of globalization, that's when the big growth of offshores happened. In the 1960s, American corporations were beginning to really expand internationally. Isn't that delicious? Mm. We were also engaged in the Vietnam War. And this posed a very serious economic problem for Lyndon Johnson. We were taking too much money out of the country to pay for the war. If the money goes out of the country, your balance of trade numbers go bad, and we had to somehow make the numbers look better. So Johnson imposed capital controls. If you wanted to take money out of the country, you had to get a permit from the Treasury Department. The corporate community was absolutely furious that they were being restrained, so they kicked up a huge storm and a, a kind of compromise was negotiated where companies could avoid paying tax on foreign income as long as they kept it offshore. American law says you can defer recognition of your active business income. That's deferral as long as you don't bring it back to the United States. So if it's offshore, it stays untaxed until you bring it home. And all of a sudden, there was an explosive growth of offshore banking. By today's standards, that offshore activity was relatively modest. Uh, we've come a long way since then. The fact that I pay more income taxes than a multi-billion dollar corporation that has trillions of dollars of assets and got bailed out, it's just unbelievable. You get really angry, but you also get really inspired. You're like, oh, that's what's going wrong. That's why we're laying off police officers and teachers. It's not just that government doesn't work, it's that government doesn't work if you don't pay your fair share. The movement is called Uncut and is modeled after a grassroots effort in the United Kingdom that publicizes companies that avoid paying taxes. I read this article about UK Uncut in The Nation magazine, how to build a progressive tea party. People in this country are incredibly angry. Uh, UK Uncut actions have basically involved people around the country using uh, social media uh, to... I immediately get on Facebook and start a group. Send it out to a bunch of my friends. A little while later, I noticed this person, Joanne Gifford, online. She was like this really level-headed, reasonable person. She's a soccer mom from Napa, California. I read the article in the nation, and I was so jacked up about it that I went right to Facebook to create a group. And I'll be darned if Ryan wasn't a step ahead of me. Joanne sees this guy, Carl, from Mississippi, on our site. 
and Carl is posting all over the Facebook page. I started a Facebook group, web page, Twitter account. I just intended this for people in Jackson, Mississippi to have a local protest. And then folks all around the country said, I want to do something in my community too. My professor, she was reading one of my blogs and I was talking about how we have to do something. Um, and she said, I just heard on the radio about US Uncut. And I just said, let me post it on Facebook. And that same night, two of the students immediately said, I'm in. A friend through Facebook posted that there was a national movement called Uncut uh, and that we had a group of people gathering in Chicago in front of Bank of America. And without a blink of an eye, I said, I'll be there. I found like the local U.S. Uncut chapter guy, got in touch with him. He didn't have time, so I took over the chapter. It's basically me getting in touch with every, everyone organizing events. I heard about it on the radio, and I wrote, you know, in scribbly handwriting while I was driving, you know, USUncut.org. And it was just about the time that with Scoutson was happening, with Scott Walker, and I got so upset, I was like, I, I can't sit around and scream at my TV anymore. I actually have to get out and do something. We spend a lot of our time complaining about the people that are making the policies. We're not looking inside ourselves and saying, how have we contributed to this ending up the way it is? It's because we didn't keep the pressure on. So that's what drives me, doing something to make a difference. We ask that you limit your oral testimony to no more than five minutes. Uh, you may proceed, Commissioner. Thank you for inviting me to discuss offshore abuses. As always, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee. In particular, I appreciate your strong support for strengthening the integrity of our tax system and for enhanced enforcement. The IRS rules are extremely squishy, and the IRS has very limited resources. The private sector businesses have enormous resources. They have an army of consultants, lawyers, economists, when I worked at the Arthur Anderson, I worked in the big tax department. The whole thing was reducing the effective tax rate, reducing the effective tax rate. Corporate tax abuse isn't something that corporations are just inventing on their own. They turn to experienced outsiders, not only lobbyists, but also law firms and accounting firms. So their ability to operate on the boundaries of the law are continually improving. Uh, it ought not to be the case that if you're a major corporation that your tax return is completely off the books. But not only are returns secret, it's very hard to know what Corporation X paid in taxes, what they declared as their income. The argument that the IRS and the companies have made is that this is competitive information. If there were complete tax certainty, the income defense industry would collapse. In 1913, when the federal tax code was first put into place, it was only a few hundred pages. Today, the U.S. tax code is 72,000 pages. It is full of loopholes, contradictions. If one can master those 72,000 pages on behalf of one's clients, one can literally drive a semi-truck right through the openings that are created in the tax system. The industry has an interest not only in mastering those pages, but maintaining the complexity and adding to it. It's not uncommon in the tax writing committees in Congress to have the same income defense industry that navigates through those pages, supplying draft paragraphs that are incorporated directly into the pages on behalf of their clients and the interests that they serve. Over the years, it's just become more and more common for the revolving door to swing between a private business and the IRS. So it's sort of like a fraternity now. The people who specialize in transfer pricing at the IRS have a way of becoming the senior officials at Price Waterhouse or the accountants at KPMG who are in charge of the transfer pricing practice. This subcommittee has shown impressive leadership in combating abusive tax shelters and those who play fast and loose with the tax code. I know that you have a full morning, so I shall be brief. The U.S. tax administration is complicated by the rapid pace at which... There is some evidence that the IRS is kind of ratcheting up the pressure. They've sort of reorganized some of their enforcement mechanisms. But there's a school of thought that, you, you know, you could double the number of IRS agents and attorneys to look at this stuff. And 
uh, fundamentally it's very difficult to enforce a system that is based on a series of made-up transactions. Google, for example, allocates the bulk of its foreign profits ultimately to Bermuda. 2003, before the IPO, Google entered into a contract with an Irish subsidiary of Google. That is, essentially from an economic point of view, entered into a contract with itself under which the Irish subsidiary acquired the rights to Google search technologies for a geographic region that encompassed all of Europe and the Middle East. The Irish subsidiary has to pay something to the U.S. for those rights. And the whole game in transfer pricing in that type of a transaction is you want the offshore unit to pay as little as possible to the U.S. parent. So Google put a transfer pricing arrangement into place with its Irish subsidiary and then went into the IRS and said, essentially, we'd like you to bless this price. Those negotiations went on for three years, and in 2006, the IRS signed off on that price. And so by 2009, Google Ireland was deriving $11 billion in revenue a year from those search technologies. That $11 billion would be subject to Irish tax, but 12.5% really isn't good enough in this business. And so Google Ireland paid the money out again to itself in the form of royalties that ultimately end up in Bermuda. And so the bottom line is that Google overseas, which operates in countries like France and the UK and Germany, countries that have tax rates of 25, 30, and 35 percent, overseas its tax rate is a little over 2 percent. Its low taxes are responsible for almost a quarter of its profits. If you take Bermuda out of the equation, $100 gets knocked off of Google's share price. As we speak, Facebook is setting up an arrangement that will move profits from Ireland into the Cayman Islands. One of the pr problems that I've seen grow in my lifetime is the difficulty that young people have in getting employment. Um, just recently, uh, an acquaintance of my wife got a, got a job as a, a receptionist in a company, and she has a, a bachelor's degree from a college, and this was seen as a great triumph for her. It's very difficult for people, especially young people, to get uh, good, good jobs today. I'm surprised that things are the way they are right now, the way this economy is. Because you grow up and your teachers and your parents are like, well, you know, go through school, make sure you read and do what your mama says and eat your vegetables and brush your teeth and do your homework. And you're going to go through college, you know, you're going to get your degree and you get in the real world and start making dollars. So I said, all right. And I got good grades, man. And I, I studied through school and like I hardly ever slept. I did a bunch of extracurriculars. I worked at the radio station. And then I got out of college. It's like, where are the jobs at? You know? I work three jobs. My rent's four fifty a month. I can't pay my rent. Meanwhile, ExxonMobil, GE, Bank of America, Citibank, all collectively owe zero dollars in federal income taxes. It's not a matter of redistributing wealth. It's simply a matter of making sure that the folks who owe taxes to the U.S. government pay their fair share in taxes, just like everybody else. U.S. Uncut is protesting in 50 major U.S. cities today after two weeks of organizing. We're meeting up in DuPont Circle, and from there, flash mob Bank of America, and we're talking about bankrupting America. How many people are going to this? A lot. A lot of people are going to pretend to be working at a bank. We're just getting out of people's ways. What if they want to go cash their check, Mommy? Did anyone hear me? No. Somebody needs to grab the PA system. Can people work a move? good instead of just sitting at home being angry and doing nothing. As a student, I am trying to just get more active and show that I, I don't approve of this and that I'm going to make a difference.
It's a little bit like um, Work? like giving birth, you know, <laughs> when you're done, you're like, oh my God. And I, I think a lot of this, like, as, as we learn and as we do more, and, like, I'm 23 and I have, like, zero organizing and protest experience. You know, I have, like, zero experience of that. I'll readily admit that. Mm -hmm. And so this is, like, definitely trial and error and, like, go as, play as we go. So we definitely made a statement. And no, we, we did what we were there We attracted do. media attention. Um, a lot of people who were coming by asking us what we were doing. We did a good thing today. We began the new century with over 20 million new jobs the fastest economic growth in more than 30 years, the lowest unemployment rates in 30 years, the lowest poverty rates in 20 years, the lowest African-American and Hispanic unemployment rates on record, the first back-to-back -back surpluses in 42 years, and next month, America will achieve the longest period of economic growth in our entire history. The year 2000, America had a budget surplus of over $200 billion. By, by the time I took office, we had a one-year deficit of over $1 trillion and projected deficits of $8 trillion over the next decade. When the deficits were created, uh, the trillion-dollar deficits were created, part of it was from additional government spending. Our war on terror begins with al-Qaeda but it does not end there. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. But also part of it was simply a collapse in tax revenues. Unless Congress acts, most of the tax relief we've delivered over the past seven years will be taken away. Some in Washington argue that letting tax relief expire is not a tax increase. Others have said they would personally be happy to pay higher taxes. I welcome their enthusiasm. Pleased to report that the IRS accepts both checks and money orders. <laughs> There's a, a large structural deficit whereby the government of the United States simply spends more than it collects. There are individual programs that can be cut, but when you're looking to save hundreds of billions of dollars a year to close the deficit gap, unless we reimagine the U.S. government providing services at the level of a 15th century government, you're not going to be able to do that on the back of spending alone. I'm pleased that uh, Senator Reid and I in the White House have been able to come to an agreement uh, that will, in fact, uh, cut spending. Republicans had secured the largest spending cuts in the history of the government, $38 billion, nearly two-thirds of the way to the $61 billion they had been fighting for. All of our social services are being slashed, hacked, and just literally put to death. It's crazy that we're cutting the money available for basic services. Uh, we've had enough. Our public services are getting cut. Threw my pennies in a wishing well, but all they did was fall. Now I'm stuck here. the federal government has become a bigger source of support for all kinds of local and state expenditures. And state and local governments are starved for revenues. No more cuts. A loud crowd inside the state capitol protested proposed cuts to K-12 education, libraries, and mental health facilities. Ohio may even resort to drilling for oil in its parks to generate revenue. Drive around the city of Vallejo, and the first thing you'll probably notice is all the potholes several closed fire stations. We have more murders in Chicago we have had thus far than there have been in the whole country of Iraq. And we want to cut our police force right now. Is that a good idea? Why is it that states have these big budget gaps? That gap is between 100 and 200 billion if you add all the states together. It has to do with the fact that sales taxes are down because people aren't buying as much stuff. Income taxes are down because their incomes have gone down. Capital gains and income from investments have gone down. 
and then states have been giving corporations all these tax breaks. That's why there's a budget gap. It's not because expenses are out of control, it's because revenue has been lost. There's all this revenue out there for the collecting if there was the political will and leadership to do it. When leaders are faced with big deficits, they sometimes have to raise taxes. Uh, no. He even approvingly cited a tax increase passed by the Democratic state legislature. Question, doesn't this show that sometimes raising taxes is necessary? No, I don't believe in raising taxes. You would not negotiate on raising taxes? Absolutely not, because it's not the problem. Say you had a deal, a real spending cuts deal, 10 to 1, as, as Byron said, spending cuts to tax increases. Speaker, you're already shaking your head. But who on this stage would walk away from that deal? When you raise your hand, if you feel so strongly about not raising taxes, you'd walk away on the 10 to 1 deal. 10 for 1. 10 for 1. I mean, and everybody would not go for that. That, if was, it was, 10 that was pathetic. To 1. That was pathetic. When they take that attitude, they are really saying, you know, I want to win this primary. <laughs> they are mm -hmm. saying that the country be damned. I want to win this primary. You know, this was, a, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's not perfect, but it's probably good. A lot of people may have slept through this budget cut and not realizing, okay, well, this is $40 billion, but the next one for the next year, they're talking about in the trillions, and it's scary to think about what's going to be cut from there. You know, I work at a hospital. There are cuts after cuts after cuts because the government is cutting funding. And it's not until it hits someone's doorstep that they wake up. And we're trying to say, no, let's not wait until it's there. Let's act now. So we're going to start off um, just sitting. You know, we're going to go in like normal people in, in the food court. Let's do the, the, our, our speech, our, our song again, so we make sure at least we have two loud voices that are <laughs> saying it all the way through. Three, two, one. U.S. Uncut, that's who we be. U.S. Concut, tax with equity. Tax with rich, tax with... Oh, you're yeah, right. It's twice. Twice. Oh. Okay. Pay, Pay what you owe. You got to give up that dough. <laughs> we're, we're not going to get arrested. That's I not right. I think... At this point, you know, the only thing holding us back is fear. I say we just do it. So What's I, that can we have seven minutes. We're, we're talking about seven minutes here of our life. Where's the best place? Is there somebody other than me that's willing to do the, the whole spiel? All right. So today we just want to say thank everybody for paying your taxes. Today is tax day. But did you know? from GE, Bank of America, and Verizon, they don't pay taxes. And do you know that because they don't pay taxes, we had the biggest budget cut in history, nearly $40 billion to education. Higher education is cut. Medicare is cut. U.S. uncut. Tax with equity. U.S. uncut. Thank you. Police. You know what? I think the most powerful thing is that we got our voice heard by young people. And if we really want to make a change, young people are the future. At this defining moment in our history, the question is not, are you better off than you were four years ago? We all know the answer to that. The real question is, will our country be better off four years from now? How will we lift our economy and restore America's place in the world? Here's what I'll do as president. To deal with our current emergency, I'll launch a rescue plan for the middle class and close the corporate tax loopholes the lobbyists put in. I can't fathom that he's completely insincere with the promises that he made. He promised that he was going to close the loopholes for corporations, the tax loopholes. So that's what I'm hoping, that the president will get our message. I want him to listen. Mr. Obama? <laughs> We're calling you. <laughs> what we've done is allowed 
one group of people, the people who pay corporate taxes, to decide what the rules are by buying politicians or renting them through the campaign process. If you live in Washington, D.C. long enough, you know that the corporate multinationals pretty much own Congress. We give you campaign money, you get yourself elected, you help us hide our money offshore and not pay our taxes. Congress is totally motivated and controlled by money. If you talk to individual members, you'll find that they're sensible folks mostly and they know what the problems are and they can say, oh yes, 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 this is a problem, this is a problem, we must do something about this. And then the next sentence will be, but we can't. Because, because what? Business done one. Lower the corporate tax rates, broaden the base. I guess, sir, I want to know, is this really on the table and when? People are so anxious in business, in the investment community. What can you tell us? I sure hope it's on the table. I'm going to put it on the table in the Ways and Means Committee uh, as chairman because I think it's just so critical. Our tax code is too complex, too inefficient, too burdensome, too high. Money, money, money can buy you silk and sable, false religion, fame and fame. Love is there. Senate Democrats failed to pass a bill Tuesday that would punish companies for shifting jobs overseas. A bipartisan filibuster is to blame for the legislation's collapse. Members of Congress are constantly running for re-election. They depend on corporations, and now the Supreme Court decisions give them rights to give them even more money. The Supreme Court just said in Citizens United that companies have the same rights as people to contribute to campaigns. Breaking news from the Supreme Court, a ruling that appears to open the floodgates for corporations and labor unions to use money from their general treasuries to pay for advertising campaigns. David, I've just come from the courtroom. What the Supreme Court did today is overturn a century of laws and practice in America, taking the restrictions away, saying that corporations can use their vast treasuries to spend money to support or oppose candidates in political campaigns. Campaigns run on money. The reason they run on money is because television time is very expensive. The last couple of presidential elections were billion-dollar elections. Only McCain has taken on big tobacco, drug companies, fought corruption in both parties. Choose hope over fear and unity over division. The promise of change over the power of the status quo. I think Obama has a hard set of choices to make. You know, this is a real world, and he has to live in it. And if he's going to be president, he has a lot of money that he has to raise. And he'd like to raise it all for $50 and $100 contributions from the man on the street. But at the end of the day, he's competing. You know, sort of follow the money. It comes from these major interests. And they're not doing this for charity. They're doing this for political influence. We go together like a little lamb. Good old George and a country song. We go together. economy that's fueled by what we invent and what we build. Nobody understands this better than Jeff Immel. President Obama appointed Jeffrey Immel, the CEO of General Electric, uh, to his council on uh, jobs and competitiveness. He understands what it takes for America to compete in the global economy. This business was one of the few businesses in the world, Mr. President, that had positive earnings every year during the crisis. Now honored to lead your counsel on competitiveness and jobs, it's a, it's a great honor. And I know that uh, despite the fact that 60% of G's revenues are outside the United States, I personally, this company, share in the responsibility and the accountability to make sure that this is the most competitive and productive country in the world. CEO 
CEO Jeff Emmel defended his company before the Economic Club in Washington, arguing the company has done nothing wrong. Like any American, we do like to keep our tax rate low. But we do it in a compliant way, and there are no exceptions. All right, I'm going to pay millions of dollars to the federal government this year. Millions, okay? And GE pays nothing. Tell well, me. Tell me. You've got to spend more, not only on finding tax loopholes, Bill. You've got to do what GE does. You've got to spend a, a small fortune creating those loopholes. Uh, it's what I call non-taxation through extraordinary aggressive representation that has to be bought. And by the way, corporate America bill buys with $4 billion a year representation that you and me and uh, our fellow citizens can't buy in Washington. The scale of this activity has exploded in the last decade. So there's just an enormous increase in the number of folks in Washington whose sole mission is to influence congressional outcomes. You know, the genius about offshoring is you don't have to convince the American public of anything. All you have to do is convince the chairman or the ranking member of a couple of committees on Washington. And that's what these campaign contributions are, all the trips on corporate jets, the golf outings, the jobs when you leave, like Senator Phil Graham, who left the Senate Banking Committee and becomes a vice chairman of the big Swiss bank, UBS. You know, we'll take care of you while you're in office, and we'll really take care of you after you get out of office. I want to read this out real quick, y'all, real quick. According to a bogus press release sent out early Wednesday, General Electric CEO Jeffrey Immel was purported to have informed the White House the company would be gifting a $3.2 billion federal tax refund to Uncle Sam on April 18th, tax day, and a bid to secure its position as a leader in corporate social responsibility. It has the look of an official corporate release, the logo at the top, the almost perfect looking website URL, and a top heading, GE promising to donate a $3.2 billion tax refund to help offset cuts and save American jobs. The Associated Press wrote an article based on the release that was picked up by several websites. Only thing, it's completely phony. The guys behind the prank, they call themselves U.S. Uncut. Activists Andrew Boyd and Justin Wiedis, who work with the grassroots group The Yes Men. I pay my taxes, why doesn't GE? That's where uh, the impulse came to do this prank. Well, we call this creative activism. Uh, it doesn't just come from us. We, we, you know, every man in the street uh, feels this sort of in their gut that there's something very wrong here. And people are figuring out that the wealth has gathered somewhere and that trickle-down economics doesn't work. Uh, you get one of these yet? Uh, I, I can't grab anything. Oh, sorry. I'll take one. Thank you. My grandfather worked at the post office, and my grandmother didn't work. She had seven kids, and they did fine. They were middle class in like a regular suburb and, and did well. The point is, under today's conditions, it's not just inflation. It's what's happened with globalization and, and what companies have achieved to make the ultimate profit with the result of just like the decimation of the middle class completely. So you can't just have a house and do what my grandfather did. The wages aren't the same, the benefits aren't the same. We were actually planning on staging uh, a homeless shelter inside a bank to protest against um, cuts that are being made to, to homeless aid and homeless shelter um, aid that's, that's being proposed right now. And so we walk 10 feet and there's people sleeping in a bank. Uh, so we didn't have to do much. Trickle down, everybody screwed now We ride only for the biggest of the bank They've made it well known, they don't want to pay for roads Let me tell you something about a friend's B of A Dead beats, tax cheats, hiding money overseas Someone that wrote to me recently, it's like a tea party Like quoted the forefathers like, whoa, what would they think about you doing this When all you care about is like corporate greed It's like, dude, the, the forefathers would not stand for corporations being in place of like a solid democratic government because it doesn't represent the people. It represents the corporations, plain and simple. Uh, and it wouldn't be acceptable back then, and it isn't now, you know.
more and more taken away from us by, via taxation, and that's the government's weapon against the people. We're overtaxed, way overtaxed. It's ridiculous. It's We're living through a societal economic panic. The Greeks went through this in 700 BC when they invented coins, and it suddenly changed the nature of human relationships. It took them 200 years to figure out what to do. We got all this great literature out of it. And the Greeks came up with the moral basis of progressive taxation. There is no wealth without Athens. The greater the wealth you manage to attain because Athens is here, the greater the burden of taxes that you must bear so Athens will endure. And when they came up with this moral principle, they invented democracy. Don't look now, young man, but somebody has his hand in your pocket. It's the hand of big government. It's taking away about four months' pay from what your daddy earns every year, one dollar out of every three in his paycheck. And it's taking the security out of your grandmother's social security. We're really coming to terms with this morning in America free lunch kind of philosophy that said, you know, you, you don't have to pay taxes and taxes are not your civic responsibility. They're just the government taking your money. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant to get government back within its means and to lighten our punitive tax burden. And these will be our first priorities. And on these principles, there will be no compromise. The main point here is the disconnect. Reagan convinced middle class people that they could have their cake and eat it. They could pay no taxes and still get public services. Since 1981, the taxes as a share of national income has fallen by 25%. We've already run this experiment with tax cuts and it hasn't paid off. We're seeing valuable investments in infrastructure, highways and bridges and programs that people need to be competitive have been slashed to the bone. Everything that government does costs money. If the government can't collect taxes from its corporations and its citizens, it can't fund schools, it can't provide for military or police, a couple's home just burned to the ground while firefighters stood there and watched. Now, it's all because the couple didn't pay a $75 fee to the local fire department in rural Tennessee. And if a homeowner doesn't pay, firefighters won't put out a fire. The mayor says it's either pay for spray or everyone has to do a tax increase. Generations of American middle class people have been told by their politicians not to make the connection. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Read my lips. I'm not going to raise taxes on middle class Americans to pay for the programs I've recommended. Read my plan. And I want to look you in the eye. I will not raise your taxes nor support a tax increase. <laughs> Come to town to seek re uh, representation. We the people need relief from overdose taxation. Foolish men will rush it in. Congressmen all greedy. At the job line, these will be the ones that we make needy. They've been told they're overtaxed. That's not true. They've been told they need tax cuts. They don't. They're paying way less taxes than any other middle class in any other developed country in the world. The thing that aids and abets this, this free lunch theory of life is the fact that the United States can borrow buckets and buckets of money from the Chinese and the Japanese for very low interest rates. Congress began this debate on whether or not to reduce corporate tax revenues to pay for our national security on the same day that our committee leadership, like our president, is meeting with the Chinese. The first question that needs to be answered in this debate is how much more America will borrow from the Chinese so that some corporations can pay less. And people basically send us money in envelopes, free, you know. And if you can do that, you feel that you don't have to tax yourselves. So people ask, when's Congress going to wake up? You know, when is that wet fish going to slap them in the face? And the answer is, 
when the Chinese decide to ask for 10% on their money. Let's bring home the $1.4 trillion in foreign earnings that's trapped overseas in countries where U.S.-based multinational national <coughs> companies do business. What the Why? system does is it makes it very easy for you to earn income in other countries and not pay much tax on it. But you have to leave it deferred. You have to leave it booked in those other places. You can't spend it in the United States. You can't use it in the United States without paying residual tax on it. How does the U.S. company get its hands on the cash when it needs cash? U.S. firms simply borrow the money that they need if they don't have enough cash from the U.S. operations. And those borrowings, in turn, give rise to deductible interest expense. And that deductible interest expense reduces U.S. taxable income even further. But you can see where you can get yourself in kind of a pickle if you say, gee, I really want that money back in the United States. We have about $1.2 billion overseas. Like other global companies, we favor repatriation of our foreign cash back to the United States where it can do some good. I badly want to bring that money back. How much does uh, your company have overseas that could be brought back? Almost here? $40 billion. The firms are victims of their own success, but success not in their business activities abroad, but in their tax planning abroad. And they now want Congress to reward them by giving them a further bonus in the form of tax-free repatriation of all that money so that they can redistribute that to their shareholders and managers. Now, what's going to make Congress move on this? Well, this is an effective way to create jobs. Well, bingo, that Congress, of course, wants to create jobs. We're talking over a trillion dollars could flow into U.S. investments and new jobs. You're coming out in favor of repatriation and giving the foreign earnings a tax cut. Tell me about your position, sir. Here we have a trillion dollars sitting overseas, and I can't figure out one reason why we wouldn't want this money back in the country being put to use in whatever way is, is best suited for the country by companies and by the government rather than having to sit overseas. It just seems logical. Right, so what will happen when these companies bring back the cash? Well, you know, unlike a lot of other arguments in the field of tax policy, we actually have a natural experiment that we conducted. In 2004, the Bush administration and Congress passed a one-year tax amnesty on foreign cash that U.S. multinationals had abroad. And instead of paying the regular 35% tax, if you brought your profits back to America, you only paid a 5% tax. And this was promoted as jobs creating. Well, one third of the benefit, $11 billion of money back to the US virtually tax free was by Pfizer, the big drug company. And what did they do the minute they got the money back home? They fired thousands and thousands of workers, and they used the money to buy back their own stock, which drives up the price of the stock, which makes the options owned by the executives more valuable. In 04, we had something similar. Uh, it did not stimulate the economy in any meaningful way. Investors will be watching Merck a day after the drug giant announced 7,000 job cuts and some plant closings to save money. Ford's board is now considering a drastic restructuring plan that would close at least 10 plants in North America and eliminate between 25 and 30,000 hourly jobs over the next five years. Words, the adjectives are being used is, are massive and very large. Uh, this would be the second time in a year that Citigroup laid off people. Remember, earlier in the year, I think they cut 5% of the, of the 320,000 workforce. That was about 17,000 people. Now GE and a lot of other multinationals are promising to create jobs again, and we just know that's not going to happen. Clearly, what's going on is they figured out that we can play this game of repatriation every five years and get 5% corporate taxes uh, as far as the eye can see. So we're going to um, an Apple retail store, Apple Computer. Um, they are supporting the Win America campaign, which is an effort to bring back a whole bunch of money that they have stored in foreign tax havens. And to bring that money back and only pay 5% in taxes instead of 35% in taxes. Awesome, and we will meet up with you soon. So I think about 20 groups have signed up for an action today. Apple likes to be the hip, cool corporation, you know, that everybody loves. And a lot of the people involved in US Uncut have Apple products. But if 
they're going to steal money from our government. We're going to say, that's not okay. And I'm going to go and tell other people that are in your store maybe buying products today that maybe they shouldn't buy your products. Given the choice between grandma getting kicked off of Medicare and uh, not having an iPad, you know, I think I'm going to go with grandma. Save our teachers, save our cops, collect the taxes from the top. And then make more money off of our backs. We think that's wrong. We think Whoa. that they should pay a fair share just like we do. Pay the tax cheat! Pay the tax cheat! Pay the tax cheat! Pay the tax cheat! The new wave of protests in Madison hit the Apple Store in Westtown Mall Saturday. A trillion dollars can be brought back into the United States at only 5% tax rate. They should be 35. When protesters entered the store at Westtown, they first set all the computers to their website, then started passing out flyers. goal here is to have in what you call a territorial system a permanent exemption from all U.S. taxes on all earnings abroad, all foreign earnings. Isn't that the goal of a territorial system? You know, I think as we said earlier, you've got to do a benchmark of the territorial systems around the world. There is, you know, not one territorial system. The largest and most sophisticated multinationals are today working together to ask Congress for a tax regime that would be even more lenient uh, than the current law. Do you agree that the goal uh, should be uh, to pay uh, zero dollars to the United States Treasury on earnings that you would have in China? Yes, I would agree with that. And I would also add that I would love to have access to the excess capital that we have Overseas. Overseas. I understand. Most countries, other than the United States, tax foreign income on a, what is called a territorial tax basis. Hong Kong has a territorial tax now. If you're a Hong Kong company, you're only taxed on the operations that actually exist in Hong Kong. They simply do not tax the international income. U.S. companies have a competitive disadvantage because not only do they pay, say, the Irish tax on their Irish source income, but then we have this bad worldwide tax system that makes the U.S. companies also pay U.S. tax on that income. We're the only country left with this worldwide system, and it really penalizes companies that are doing business worldwide that are American companies. We are not the only country that taxes corporations worldwide, and we give a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit. So if you pay the Saudis a dollar of tax, you get a dollar off here. Um, it turns out that if we went to a pure territorial system and said, we're not going to tax the profit churn offshore, the taxes of the big multinationals would actually go up. The U.S. tax system today, when understood by someone who actually knows how the rules really work, ends up being better for multinationals than a true territorial tax system because every country that has a territorial system has very important limitations to protect the domestic tax base. U.S. companies, in fact, want a better than territorial system. They want one without any restrictions or limitations so that, in fact, they will end up with zero tax all over the world, including in the United States, on their U.S. income. That's the ultimate game for which U.S. multinationals are playing. U.S. multinationals are extraordinarily good at raising their hand and saying, that's the only reason why we can't compete. And if only we had what every other company had in every other country, then we would be competitive. Somehow Congress never realizes it's nonsense when it comes from a multinational corporation. In fact, it's just a recipe for having a lot of our corporate tax base move offshore to jurisdictions without taxation where we won't see any of that revenue at a time when there's a stronger argument than ever before for having global taxation. We're trying to run in the opposite direction. It's hard to imagine how it could get worse, but it actually could. I propose to eliminate all federal corporate income tax. Our corporate rate is 35%. The European average is 25 Stupider than Europe, more destructive than Europe's tax structure is not where the United States should be. I think we do need a reduction permanently in the corporate tax rate. If you want people to obey the tax system, 
and you want freedom and you want economic growth, lowering tax rates is the way to go. The problem here is, is that Britain just did this. The British said, oh my goodness, companies are running out the door. We must lower our corporate rate to bribe them to come back. And they're still, you know, moving money to the Channel Islands and things like that. They could cut it to 30, they could cut it to 28, they could cut it to 26. But you really can't compete very well with zero. Well, Estonia cut taxes. Other European countries did the same thing. And soon it was like an arms race to the bottom. And now Ireland, if you've been there, is a mess. I mean, the public sector is starved for capital. Corporate investors that came to Ireland from Silicon Valley uh, weren't really doing anything real. It was a shell game. So the result is today, when it went away and shifted elsewhere, Ireland is left without any infrastructure, without any R&D base, and with no competitive advantage. It was just a tax haven, and it's learned the hard way that tax havens come and go. It's just very humorous uh, to me as a small business owner to really even fathom believing that giving massive corporations and the richest 2% in America tax cuts is going to help me. It doesn't help me. The reason it doesn't help me and the reason it doesn't help actual small business owners is because small business owners do business with a handful of moderately paid people. So if the middle class do doesn't exist or doesn't have any money, then we don't have any money. We as Americans have to decide whether or not we want to be a community, we want to be a strong unit, or if we want to be every man for himself. And I would be willing to bet that the majority of Americans need a community in order to survive. And just because the wealthiest in the United States don't, doesn't mean that they should be able to take over our entire tax system and make all of the rules. My buddy over here, Jim Coleman, decided we should come out here and pretty much just stand and pass out information and uh, talk to people about, uh, about the issue. This is my 11th Saturday in a row. I'm actually a small businessman, um, and I come out here. Thank you. I come out here because uh, corporate tax cheating is putting an unfair burden on small businesses, along with middle class. In the last 15 years, small business has created 64% of all new jobs. Multinational corporations have advantages that small businesses do not have. Look, your small business owner, he's doing his own payroll, filing his own taxes, he's doing all the right things that we expect a business owner to do. And these are companies that pay their taxes, and they don't have an offshore haven. They don't have a subsidiary in the Cayman Islands. They can't game the system. So we end up with a system where U.S. domestic firms, in fact, face a relatively high tax burden and one that is largely inescapable. If you're a local tech company and have to compete against Cisco or Oracle or some of these big global conglomerates, if you're a local camera store, a community bank, you know, there are banks that draw deposits and make loans within their communities and pay their taxes. They have to compete against Wells Fargo and Bank of America and all the big banks that not only took our tax dollars and trashed the economy, but are now not paying any taxes. We started our company back in 1980, and most of the people here We've been working with us over 20 years. The main areas where we sell, we sell to corporate, we sell to commercial, and we sell to military. We draw from these inventories that we have around the world. For a C-130 part, we were quoting the U.S. government $1,000. We are Lockheed, we found out after, was quoting $8,000 for a quantity of eight each. They were awarded the contract, and we weren't. $8,000 versus $64,000. In early 
early 2009, the General Accountability Office found that 63 of the largest 100 federal contractors had subsidiaries in offshore tax havens. Most of their income comes from the federal government, and then they're hiding their money offshore to keep from paying taxes on that. selling parts, commercial, military, earning money from taxpayers. I mean, we're a small company. We're paying taxes. They should be paying taxes. How can our government allow these corporations to get away with that? I'm hoping that something will be done. It's not easy being a small business right now. It's really... It's really stressful. The most productive sector of the economy for generating jobs has indeed been the private sector, but it's been small business, and intermediate business. We need to think about the tax burdens on that segment specifically. We need, in effect, revenue neutral corporate tax reform where U.S. multinationals are asked to pay more and domestic production is burdened by a lower corporate rate that will lead to more jobs in the United States, that will lead to a better balanced economy Multinational companies, simply from the size, they have some advantage over small businesses. But when they also shed their taxes by hiding their profits overseas, it again enables them to reduce the cost of their goods and services. So if we do have a race to the bottom on all costs, then only the multinationals will be left standing. Small businesses will be out of business. And I don't think the American public wants that. Because we truly will only have one type of society out there. We'll have a society that is working for minimum wage. You won't be able to pull yourself up by the bootstraps anymore because you won't be able to compete with the multinational corporations. This is a boiler that we just put in a couple months ago and I'm just checking things to make sure that it's still working right. This is what's cool about what I do is, is you know, this is something that's going to be here past my lifetime. The way the economy is affected by clients is they're more afraid than ever to spend money to do things. It's the Walmarting of everything in America. It's a race to the bottom. Can you make it cheaper? There's no respect for quality work anymore. This is a skill that, you know, when I, when I pass will go with me. Um, and the way the economy is with construction, this is something that I would want to pass on to my son or my daughter. You know, you, you can't make a decent living doing it anymore. That's why I protest, um, is because I'm more fearful for what the opportunities are going to be for them in their life. Don't blame the companies. Companies have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to legally maximize the after-tax rate of return. And I think that's great. Multinational corporations always come back with the same argument, that this stuff is legal, they're responding to the wishes of the shareholders, and they should do it as much as they can. But what's legal is not necessarily what's right. Apartheid in South Africa was legal in its day. Slavery was legal in its day. In a very strict legal sense, you could argue that corporations are only responsible to their shareholders. But in the broader sense, they're stakeholders in America. They use our society, they use our labor force, they use our infrastructure. America allows them to earn all these profits. Don't they have to pay something back to the system? Isn't it really their civic duty, like any citizen, to pay their fair share of taxes? They're benefiting from all the same governmental services that we're paying for. The military, protection, the court system that they use all the time. And when they're not paying taxes, every person in this country has to pay more money to subsidize 
the multinational corporations. You know, I spent the last 10 years giving hundreds of talks about taxes, and most people feel I can't do anything. Well, that's not a good thing to hear. This country got rid of slavery. Women got the right to vote. I have magazine clippings from more than a century ago where various ministers said the efforts to get child labor laws were the work of the devil. It's God's plan that these children should work in these factories. Well, we finally got child labor laws. We only make progress when people demand it. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing. They need to have forces arrayed against them who are saying, no, we need to have a set of rules that are fair and reasonable for everyone, because those are the rules that will produce the greatest economic growth for all of us and the greatest social stability. I believe that we need to increase taxation on wealthier individuals and on corporations in the United States. I believe that our our budget deficits would disappear very quickly. I think that combined with a little less adventurousness in our foreign policy. If we're going to support by far the largest military in the world, accounting for 43% of all defense spending in the world, if we're going to provide a minimal level of social services like Social Security and Medicare, it is inevitably the case that we're going to have significant taxes. Sooner or later, and you don't have to be a flaming liberal to believe this, we're going to need tax increases. And where are those tax increases going to come from? Well, you would think the first place Congress would look are where there are loopholes and abusive situations. Normally, I would say to you, with the lobbying power of corporate America, these laws would never be subject to change. But we are not in normal times. I'd rather pay less tax than more tax. Uh, but I'd also prefer to live in a country that doesn't go bankrupt. Uh, and at the moment, because we live with the myth that we are a high-tax country, because we live with the myth that the government is our enemy, we are setting ourselves up for unsustainable budget deficits that will lead ultimately to a financial economic calamity of a magnitude completely unappreciated by the average American. These are not the sort of images a failing country that depends on the tourist trade wants the world to see. But this is what the center of Athens looked like again today. Raging battles blowing back and forth through the capital's main square. Thousands of angry Britons protested in London against planned austerity measures. The government maintained that its spending cuts are designed to boost the economy. According to local media, the protesters, most of them young people who are demanding a social and political change in Spain, attempted to block the passage of police vehicles and damaged tires. Protesters are angered by crippling unemployment, bankrupt banks, and an $83 billion austerity package that both raised taxes and took away government benefits. Demonstrators fought running battles with police in a rampage through the streets around Rome's historic landmarks. I think everybody wants to believe that the movement that comes along, the message you put out, is going to make the difference. You know, that's going to be the one thing. It's going to be the one that lights the fire. And I don't think that's what changes things. I think what changes things is the cacophony of all those movements, of all those different people feeling that same way. I feel like we did our part to stir things up, you know? And now it's manifesting itself in this. So I'm proud in the way that we started taking it to the streets and you know, spreading really powerful messages virally on the internet. 
I actually believe that U.S. Uncut was one of the parents of Occupy. You know, we were out there a year before, um, and there were other groups. I mean, there were the Bold Progressives, there was Move On. I mean, right now, you know, a lot of the energy that U.S. Uncut has has been drawn into Occupy because it's given us a 24-hour message board. I think they've already achieved changing the debate. They've addressed the issues that no party is addressing. I mean, it's for the first time in 60 years we're actually talking about economic inequality. And that issue is now on the surface. We're the first people here. Look at this. Me and Mark are the first people here. So to God. I mean, Americans know in their heart that this is unfair. People say, well, you know, what, you can't do anything about it. I, I disagree. I think it's already been proven with the work we've done over the last year that you don't have to accept it. It doesn't have to be the way things are. We want a country Milestone. Gotta pay the man 